Hello, everybody. Um, let's get started here. Okay, so hello. Um, as Lydia says, my name's Matt Woods. Uh, I work at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, where I head up uh, production software development. Um, and we're really interested in using genomic information to further our understanding of human and mammalian diseases. Um, and so it was just three things I wanted to talk about. Oh, 10, 0, and 1. Okay, that's binary, I guess. Um, so uh, three things I wanted to talk about uh, today. I want to talk about a bit about, bit about, our, bit about our background, um, some information about uh, the state of current state of play in the new genomic landscape, and just finishing up a little bit about our process. Um, so we can get started here. So previously uh, on the Human Genome Project, um, oh, there's a picture missing there. So the Human Genome Project um, was a worldwide consortium. Uh, it took 15 years to decode, and the basic idea was that we tried to um, find all three billion letters of the human genome. And the idea behind this was that once you know these three billion letters, and uh, funnily enough, those letters are G, T, A, and C. Um, <laughs> it's fate, obviously, that I'm here. Um, so you, it's just a linear string of three billion letters, right? And once you understand uh, the sequence of these three billion letters, um, you can start to look at the relevance in terms of disease. And what should be there on the left-hand side is a printout. Uh, we did a printout of the full three billion letters at eight point text, and it's absolutely massive. Um, but you'll just have to take my word for that. Um, so it was a very large project, as I say. Um, cost around $3 billion, we think. Um, although, to be honest, we're not really sure what it cost. It was such a large project, uh, such uh, on a worldwide scale, um, that it probably cost a lot, lot more than that. Um, it's interesting, partly, uh, in the information that it, it provided and in providing a foundation uh, for modern biological research, but also because it was a race for a prize. There was two consortiums actually going head to head on sequencing the genome. There was a private institute um, based in the US and a worldwide consortium of open um, advocates. Um, and had the private institute um, sequenced the genome first, uh, the data wouldn't have been made available. Luckily for us, um, the Wellcome Trust, uh, who fund our research, basically wrote a blank check and we were able to get there first. And so we were able to do the full human genome in around 15 years. Um, because we're a charity, um, we're actually able to just give away this data. Um, so it's completely open data. Uh, you can connect up at various different levels. You can get it off our FTP site. You can just connect up and download it. We have denormalized databases. You can just um, connect up to our MySQL databases and query the data right there. Um, it's all also all open source. And so all the, uh, all the source code that was used to generate this data, used to analyze it further downstream, is all available and open. Um, and the, primarily written uh, in Perl. So Perl is really the language of bioinformatics. So who here uses Perl? Hey, yeah, my peeps. Um, <laughs> so we've actually got a lot of Perl, right? So it's, it's unusual to see projects this, this size in Perl. Most Perl projects are CGI scripts, that sort of thing. Uh, so I checked our source code repository um, before I left. Uh, we have around 4,500 modules, uh, and I started to do a, a line count um, of uh, how many lines we have, but it didn't finish before my plane had to leave. So uh, I have no idea how many lines, but 4,500 Perl modules, that's uh, a, reasonable, a reasonable size. Um, so once we'd done the human genome, um, we started to move onwards, and we started to look at other species. Um, so specifically, uh, some examples, these little wriggly guys, these are nematode worms. Um, interesting, because we know the full genome. And they're not, in genomic terms, that dissimilar from us. Um, this little guy, ah, oh, yeah. chimpanzee, obviously. And my personal favorite, the duck-billed platypus. So this guy is all kinds of freaky. Um, so from a genetic point of view, um, he occupies a very unique position in evolution, shall we say. He's got this weird platypus face. Uh, he's a mammal that lays eggs. Um, humans have two sex chromosomes, X and Y. Um, if you have two X, you're a woman. If you have XY, you're a man. Um, Duckbill platypus guy here has 10 sex chromosomes, and nobody knows how they determine their sex. Um, so <laughs> I guess they know, right. But, um, so, so we just finished uh, publishing the, the draft genome uh, of the duckbill platypus, and you might ask, what, like, why do we want to do this? Um, of all the 40 species we've done, including the duckbill platypus and the mouse and the rat, um, gorilla, all these other species, uh, why are we doing it? Uh, and the, the role really is to map evolutionary space. We want to be able to see, going backwards through time, through the millennia, um, how we've evolved. Um, 
And the idea is that we want to be able to compare genomes. So compare a mouse with a rat, a mouse with a human genome, see where the similarities are, because highly conserved regions of genomes are likely to have biological importance. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting when you start comparing species, and that, that's a good thing to do. Um, but when you start comparing individuals, it starts to get really, really interesting. Now, um, up till about six, 12 months ago, this was uh, prohibitively expensive. It took 15 years just to do one individual. We couldn't do another individual because it would take another 15 years, and we certainly couldn't compare large numbers of individuals. Um, but there's recently been a quantum leap in the actual chemistry associated with doing, with doing this uh, process. Um, and it's meant that what we can do is we can start to look at individual human genomes for the first time. So this, you may have heard of companies like 23andMe, Navigenics, doing personal genomics um, for a, you know, $500, that sort of thing. So this is a step beyond that. What they're doing, for, doing is looking for known genes. What we're doing is looking for novel genes. Um, and we recently ran a very large scale study with 10,000 individuals. Um, and we identified some novel genes which could be used for therapeutics. Uh, for such diseases as high blood pressure, so hypertension, we look at diabetes, um, coronary heart disease, bipolar disorder, uh, and we're doing a lot of work with, uh, with malaria, partially funded by uh, this guy, Bill Gates. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, so th that's really what we're about, um, and we've already been able to make uh, some, some reasonable inroads into some of these diseases and find novel targets for therapy. Um, using Pearl, all my Pearl guys. Uh, see, counts for something, Pearl 6, yeah. Okay, um, so moving on, uh, I can talk, about, uh, talk a bit about the, the sort of process um, that we go through. Um, so in, in the new genomics, and for the first time, um, modern molecular biology and modern biological research has moved from being basically a lab process into a software process. Um, the amount of data being generated for the first time uh, requires very, very, very high quality software. So this is orders of magnitude beyond these um, CGI Perl scripts. And we're now starting to have to get a lot better at, very, at developing very, very high quality software and maintaining that quality throughout. Um, this is particularly true in, in, the, in the region that I work, um, in, the, in the sequencing um, informatics team at the Sanger Institute, um, where we're responsible for taking the samples from individual people and running them through our sequencing pipeline, generating the data, and then generating the genome at the end. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this and a couple of key challenges, which, although are novel and interesting from, a, from our perspective, I think have a broader appeal. Um, so a quick look at our, our little process here. Pretty simple, deceptively so, but pretty linear, right? So we, first of all, we register our projects. It's pretty easy. We register the samples, so this would be uh, a bit of gorilla or an individual or something like that. Um, we prepare the sample. This is actually a lab process that we need to go through. We do the sequencing, and then we do some analysis on the, the data that comes off the sequencer. Um, so although it's linear, we run a very, very high throughput system. And that means that any failure at any of these points can have a, a dramatic effect. And because sequencing is so expensive, um, we want to optimize for, for this bit here. So any decrease in our software quality, remember this is all just data these days, any decrease in our software quality can have very, very large, very, very expensive um, push-on effects. It's particularly important when we're dealing with what we call golden samples. So these are samples that we couldn't get again, even if we wanted to. So if we have um, a bug which stops sequencing at some point, or there's some low-quality software which causes problems down here, we've got a sample which is effectively going off at the top of the pipeline that we can't get in, we can't get that sample again, and we'd lose the data from it. So quality is, is extremely important to us and becoming more and more so. And so I'm just going to go over some of the challenges and some of the tools that we've come up with to try and maintain quality as we go through. First of all, some more pretty pictures. Uh, so this is actually a sequencing machine uh, in our R&D lab. Um, the sample sort of goes in here. That's a username and password on the uh, post-it <laughs> note. Um, you want to see it again? Right. Uh, so the samples actually get loaded onto this glass cell. Uh, that's a laser and a one megapixel camera. Uh, we can load eight samples at a time. And basically, we shine a laser at the sample. It fluoresces at different wavelengths. Take a photo, one megapixel photo, and then we use image analysis to derive sequence from it. Uh, here's another piece of laboratory equipment. All about Heath Robinson. You can see lots of fluids and cables and stuff. Um, and again, there's another photo of the, where the actual samples get loaded. And the laser, huge amount of robotics, um, very, very difficult uh, to manage. Uh, so 
The first problem that we have is, as I mentioned, one of throughput. We're a very, very high throughput facility. Uh, we've got the largest deployment of these machines, I think, in the world. It's just about to get a, a lot bigger. Um, and just to give you an idea of the rate of change, here's a graph of the number of gigabases. This is the number of bases that we're sequencing per month. So with the previous facility, we were doing slightly under five gigabases a month. With our new Illumina production facility, you can see the difference. And so this is why it's now turned from being just a question of handling samples into a lab in terms of actually handling data. This works out at a huge amount of data. Uh, and this is our, our, our sort of throughput. So we have our, our sequencing machines in blue over here on the left. Um, these, um, we mirror the information from them onto a 320 terabyte storage array. That's connected to a 1,000 core sequencing farm. There's a quad cores um, machines. Uh, and eventually, that's moved off our, onto an archive. So the, the sequencing farm here basically takes care of a number of different things. And the sort of key number to date is 75 terabytes, which is the amount of data that we generate every single week. So at full capacity, uh, we're running 75 terabytes. So you Perl guys, you're still with me, right? 75 terabytes? OK. So uh, we actually use a mixture of Perl and Ruby now. So if anybody tells you Ruby and Rails don't scale, uh, right, OK. <laughs> I'll see you outside. Um, if anyone tells you Ruby and Rails doesn't scale, you send them to me. Twitter have it easy, believe me. Like, this is, this, these are pretty big numbers. Um, so the sequencing farm basically takes care of a number of different things. The, the PCs that control uh, the actual sequencing instruments haven't got enough disk space on them uh, to store all the data for a single run. So we need to mirror that information off in real time. We need to check some it at either end. And there's a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure there, a lot of blades basically in the sequencing farm which just take care of that. Uh, they also generate a huge number of uh, interim files that we need to be able to read in, uh, analyze, and um, basically look to see if there's any problems with the sequencing process as it's in process, because we want to be able to stop it because it's expensive if something's going wrong. So we're talking in the region of 100,000 different files which we need to load into a database in order to analyze. So there's a lot of work goes into maintaining that. Um, we're starting to look at image reduction technologies. Um, because these images are very large, we can't store them for very long. But if we reduce them down, maybe we can. Um, and then there's uh, sort of more informatics type things, assembly and alignment, uh, which has a lot of uh, high throughput and a lot of infrastructure associated with it. Um, so uh, here, as an example of the throughput, is uh, um, one, of our, one of our applications. This is a Rails application. Um, and I can just zoom in on some interesting features here. Um, so you can see at the top here, uh, we've got a, a readout of how many bases that we've sequenced for this particular project. So that's just under a terabase of sequence. And to give you an idea, that's more than had ever been sequenced in the whole history of mankind before this project was run. Um, so we've just done it on that one, in this one project. Uh, and if you look at the top here, this is a pilot. This is what they're running to make sure that the, the project will work eventually. So a terabase of sequence in a pilot project, um, just to give you some some idea of the rate of throughput. So there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of work goes on in maintaining quality here, um, particularly because any network problems, any hardware problems can have this huge backlog effect. So we had a, a network outage lasted a, a day or so, and that caused a two-week backlog um, for us to push through. So anything that we can do to maintain quality there is important. And tied into that uh, is the phenomenal rate of change um, so uh, we heard this morning from people talking about auto-generating their test cases and things like this um, because their domain um, wasn't changing at a very high rate. They were able to do that. Uh, it's completely the opposite in scientific software and a lot of other domains. Uh, the rate of change is absolutely phenomenal. It's basically always in flux. So much so that when we were receiving these, um, these instruments from the, from the vendor, um, when they first arrived, they had to have hand-drilled holes in the side of them because they were overheating when they left the factory. So when the instruments aren't even, set, aren't even stable, and the pipelines and the process in the laboratory aren't even stable, um, we need to come up with good ways of handling this, very, this, this environment of change. And we can actually use it to our advantage, so long as we have high quality tools around it. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about in a bit more detail um, is an approach of flexible data capture that we use. Um, so traditionally, if you have a database-driven application, uh, you would have um, you know, rows, which would contain the actual information, and columns, which would contain your fields, your attributes. Right? Um, that's fine, except there's a reasonable amount of overhead in maintaining the schema of your database. Uh, and because we're running high, so, such high throughput uh, environments, 
um, we can't often take the time to redevelop our schema to make a change for something as simple as adding uh, a new field to a project specification or a sample specification. Or particularly, as the workflow in the laboratory changes, we can't stop what we're doing and stop production just because they've introduced a new machine or they want to collect a new piece of QC information. Um, so uh, we call this Helix. Um, it's basically a system of virtual fields. So rather than being uh, primary database columns, primary attributes, um, these are, are virtual, basically. They're still stored in the database, but they're, they're a little bit more flexible. And they basically allow us to make changes at runtime. Uh, one problem we have is that things happen so quickly that we often don't know they've happened until they've already happened. But we still need to collect the provenance information of these samples as they run through the process, as they run through the pipeline so that the analysis can be complete at the other end. Um, so what happens when that process changes, we need to be able to basically model it almost effectively in real time because it's changed, and if we don't collect that information there and then, we've lost it forever, and the analysis can't continue, and that sample would effectively have been wasted, which is very expensive, but again, if we've got these golden samples, uh, it can be a real problem. So how does this work? Um, so uh, very, very simple. So we have a sample, uh, and it would have a couple of fields, right? So name, organism, concentration that the sample was taken from. Um, for Rails aficionados, any Rails people? Where's my Rails peeps? Yeah, put them up. Um, so this is basically how it works. So we have a sample, and we basically say that um, in this sort of modeling language that it has many descriptors, and then it has many descriptor values. And we store the descriptors um, with some additional metadata. So that's the actual definition of the specification. And we store the values in another table with some denormalized information against it. It basically boils down to just key value pairs. Um, so for example, if we've got our, our family of our sample here, uh, our record would have the same things stored in key value pairs. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, so this is a lot faster than you think, right? So with some, with some, with some clever indexing and some good denormalization, we build a lot of denormalization, automatic denormalization tools and denormalization DSLs, which are available on GitHub, um, open source. Just give me a shout if you want access to it. Uh, it's a lot faster than you'd think. Um, so this is some of the sort of information that we collect. Uh, we have a UI for specifying these things. Again, we don't have to take the app down or the pipeline down if we want to, want to make a very, very simple change. You can see the sort of information we want to collect. A lot of it is related to funding, um, the sponsor, which platform it's going to run on, additional comments, all that sort of thing. And each one of these is, is, a, is a virtual field. Um, and I can zoom in on this a little bit so you can see it. Uh, we also automatically generate all our UIs. Um, so as the data model changes, we don't have to go back through the application, retest it, make sure it's all in the right place and that the flow is still in place just because we've added another field. And you can see that we can add things like drop downs and required fields and we've got uploads and uh, various other bits and pieces like that. And initially we had hoped that um, this would allow us to just keep on trucking when we wanted to change our data model. Um, it's turned out to be a lot more, a lot more useful than that because um, we can map change very, very quickly but uh, the application is automated, basically. So uh, the UI builds itself. Um, old values know how to represent themselves. And we can migrate between values as we go through. But we don't have to, every time we make a change to the data model, go back through the application, update all our UIs, and then make sure that everything works. So it makes testing um, and updating and maintenance very, very easy. So what happens when, when change occurs, right? So we've got, our, we've got our original sample. This is version 1. And then we want to update our data model. Um, so you can see down here, we've added two additional fields, an origin and some sort of quality metric. Um, all we do is uh, jump into our editor. At runtime again, we make sure that everything's working. We add the additional fields. Um, and then automatically, oops, automatically the UI updates. So we don't have to take the app down. We don't have to rerun all our automated tests, although there are a lot in there to make sure that all this runs smoothly. Uh, the application just keeps on running. And to certain trusted users, um, we can allow them to do this right there in the lab. To start with, we made it open to everybody. That was a really bad idea. They went crazy here, and it, it was like Facebook or something. It was, it was <laughs> not what we had in mind at all. Anyway, so um, yeah, access control, very important. Um, so, so it allows us basically to maintain quality because we've already got our tests in place um, for this data abstraction effectively. And because we've got that in place at a, at a foundation level, the rest of the application can just keep on trucking. So it's important in terms of actual, actually creating this sort of thing, but all our, our search engines, um, we can build queries right there in the UI, and they all automatically update because we know the, um, 
the keys and the values. It makes it really easy for people just to jump in and get at the information they need. Um, we can update all our reports. So we have a lot of things which automatically look for related failures. And because we've got this data abstraction, we can, um, we can dig into the data and use the metadata associated with that to build UIs and to uh, identify failures early in the process. Um, and you can see where these are the sort of versions we're, we're talking about. So in only six months, we're already sort of at version 20. So although it took a little bit of time to get this sort of thing up and running, it certainly paid off. Um, we're not completely crazy. Um, we do also rationalize. So as the data model starts to settle down, for example, all samples now have a name, we will basically refactor that out into, uh, into the database for even faster queries. As I mentioned, we've got some migration tools uh, so we can move forwards and backwards between different families. Uh, we've got a UI to do that as well, so we can just select the different versions of the families, uh, and the UI will detect um, differences between them. And again, this just allows us to keep the application up as we make changes, which happen uh, really, really very frequently. Um, we also use this for our pipeline application, so we have some kind of workflow uh, in the laboratory, for example, that we want to collect the provenance information, um, the, the basic process information for a particular sample um, in terms of the name or the operator, the serial number of particular chemicals that are being used. And again, we can specify this at runtime uh, without any problems. And we use that for our lab and QA pipelines. And here are some of them here. Um, you can just jump in. And here are the sort of steps that you can see. And we can add new steps, remove old ones, reorder them, all this sort of thing. Again, allows us to just keep on trucking uh, without any problems. OK. So it basically allows us to change a maneuver at speed. Uh, and in modern biology and in any sort of environment which is in flux, um, this, sort of, this sort of technique can be really, really helpful. Um, so the third problem we have is one of scale. Um, so um, I don't know how many of you um, read the Technium, Kevin Kelly's Technium blog. So he has this idea of uh, what he calls trillionics, right? So this is the idea that um, once you start getting into orders of magnitude changes in scale, uh, the whole game changes. So the example he uses is with a penny. Uh, a penny, a single penny, is very, very easy to manage, right? You can put it in your pocket. I can pass it around. It's, it's easy. If you have a trillion pennies, they take up more than the volume of a sports stadium. And then you start getting into really big problems. And um, modern biology and a lot of other fields are now having this very large data explosion, um, which take us into this realm of trillionics. For example, if we only had a two-fold increase um, in our data throughputs, we'd already be at 150 terabytes per week. Um, and that starts to get really difficult to handle. And obviously, it's no real surprise that we already have machines in our R&D lab that have exactly this capacity and can do it in half the time that we used to. So we're already looking at 300 terabytes per week that we have to now manage and process. And this, again, is where having high quality software in place and having these sort of tools which make an advantage of the fact that change is going to happen rather than bake in um, rigid functional specs, um, really a big advantage. So for example, over the next three months, we're going to be adding more hardware. So we're going to add probably another 400 additional nodes onto our farm. Um, we're going to have another 200 terabytes of storage probably to handle these things. Um, and this is in addition to the Institute's already large data center. So we've got one of the largest data centers in Europe um, that I know of. Um, and uh, we, we spin around 17,500 disks. We have about five petabytes of online storage at any one time. Um, so it's a reasonably large endeavor, um, and it's, it's a good thing to be a part of. Um, so as we start to collect up this additional data, and we have these petabytes and petabytes of stuff, um, we need to start looking forwards. Um, and this is something that we call a, a virtual institute. So um, we have lots of data, as I said. Um, and because we're open and we provide the data for free to any, anybody that wants it, um, we have a lot of people that want to get at that data. Um, and you can see it, it starts to multiply up because lots of people with lots of data require lots of compute. Um, and they've all got lots of uses that we haven't yet even thought about. And there's lots and lots and lots of other things that we need to start thinking about not least of which is the amount of money that this sort of thing costs. Um, we are, as I say, a charity. Uh, we're a reasonably large, well-funded charity. But uh, the whole team that puts all this together is only 15 people. So we've got really very hard resources and hard limits on what we can do there. So we need to make the most of every single little thing. Um, so all of you that work in 800 strong engineering departments, uh, you want to make a change and come work for somebody a bit smaller, do something good, we're hiring. Um, so just to finish up then, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about our process. And with such a small team, 
um, how, do we, how do we make this work, basically, and how do we do it in a reasonable way? Well, as I've sort of hinted at, um, we, don't have, we don't put a lot of sway in, in functional specifications. Um, so this is the sort of typical like, software 101 like, timeline. So you have a concept, uh, you build some, you generate some requirements by chatting to your users, whatever, you do some development, and then eventually you end up as a product. And it's that easy, right? Um, obviously, sorry? What was that? Easier. Easier than that, right, okay. You can take out uh, requirements most of the time. Um, <laughs> Or in some cases, a concept. I don't know. Uh, so we use the process of Scrum, basically. So anybody here use Scrum? Yeah, good. This is easy. So with Scrum, um, for those of you who don't know, basically, it's much more iterative than that. The problem that you have is that as you're developing, um, your requirements are changing all the time. Um, and so we have a central idea. We start to prepare for our iteration. We go through a development sprint. We plan, we review, and then we just keep cycling round and round. And for those of you who, who don't do this, it provides a very, very focused method of development. It keeps, you, uh, keeps your eye on the particular problems, and for us, allows us to, to iterate at a, at a very rapid rate. With a small team that don't have resources um, that they need, um, this allows you to always be on top of what you need to do. Um, so we have a lot of interaction with uh, our project owners. Um, so they come to our Scrum meetings. We meet with them uh, virtually every day to make sure that they're in the loop. And these will either be internal people, um, principal investigators, other scientists, people like that. Um, and we also have weekly releases. Um, so we don't mess around here. As soon as the product's ready to go, we iterate at a, at a very, very high rate. Um, this allows us to just basically be more flexible um, in terms of what we need to do. It allows us to break down and get a very good understanding of the domain. And I think that's a real advantage to Scrum for those of you who don't do it. Um, takes less time, obviously, because we've always got a working build, basically. We can just push it out the door. Um, and there's better transparency as well. This is a, a, a common problem in scientific software. People don't know the process, and they don't have a high confidence in it. Uh, most importantly, it leads to less software. So of 4,500 Perl modules, we've gone from that to the new platform, which is only about 5,000 lines powering all this stuff. Um, so uh, we really, really try and pare down as much as possible. And that's running this full multi-petabyte storage um, system. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. Uh, obviously, I don't do all this on my own, as I say. Uh, we've got a good team in sequencing informatics back in, uh, in Cambridge, back in the UK. So thank you to those, and uh, thank you to you for listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> we've got time for some questions, if anybody has any. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the question is, what was the source of the change uh, in terms of data modeling? So primarily, it's a change in scientific process. Um, so um, science is always innovating. It never, ever stands still. So a process which is cutting edge, you know, one month can be completely usurped by something that comes along in the literature the next month. And um, particularly biologists are very, very keen to put the best practices in as soon as possible. So uh, if a protocol in the laboratory changes, or there's a new instrument, for example, that comes along, they'll want to get that and implement it very, very quickly. And as I say, that will affect the overall analysis further downstream. So it's, if you like, in-stream changes um, that we have to be able to monitor, collect, and then filter in further downstream. And because we have this um, data modeling layer, effectively, uh, we can do that and maintain our metadata. And the systems downstream, we have these loosely coupled um, analysis systems and QC systems, uh, they know how to read and write, basically, with this data modeling layer. So although we make a change, uh, it can still figure out further downstream how to use the new information in the analysis with very, very minor tweaks. And we have DSLs and things to make that even easier. And this all comes, again, because we're a relatively small team. We have a lot of data to deal with. Uh, yeah, the back there. Right, so for those of you who didn't hear it, the question was, with such a large amount of data, how do we identify failures? Um, so there, there's a couple of different failure states, if you like. Uh, the first is a, is a process failure. So um, somebody drops a slide, or a sample gets contaminated, and that sort of thing. And that, we again, we handle in software. Um, and we basically have message systems which alert the necessary bits and pieces um, to, to a, failed, a failed run. Um, the second state, if you like, is an analysis failure. Um, which happens once we've collected all this data. And this is why it's so important to be able to model on the fly. 
because um, analysis failures are very, very expensive. These machines are expensive, uh, a run is expensive, and people's time is expensive. Um, so in that sense, we have a lot of tools which go back over these, this, this model data. And again, we spend a lot of time getting this right so that we can identify um, similar problems in, an, in, a, in a failed run. So we can look back through the, through the pipeline information, see similarities between multiple fails, and identify what that is. Most often, it's a, a piece of laboratory equipment which hasn't been calibrated correctly, or as I say, somebody who's, we often identify people who aren't following a protocol, um, that sort of thing. On top of that, as I say, there's, there's analysis failures, um, which we have a lot of automated tools for identifying. So we generate, as I say, a huge amount of metadata around the sequence, um, quality scores, um, intensity scores of the laser, um, temperature graphs, all these different things. And we put all that into a database and mine it, basically. And there's a whole group of people that, that just spend their time looking at that. On top of that, we have a group of project managers who go through every single run and eyeball all this different information and information derived from it to identify potential problems. Uh, and they often make a call as to whether it's a pass or a fail based on that. So, uh, so it's, it's an interesting, interesting problem to be involved with. Uh, yeah? In the middle? Right. <laughs> so the, the first question was, have we looked at document-based uh, databases, so schemaless based CouchDB, that sort of thing? Uh, we have a little bit. Um, the reason it's done in this slightly bizarre relational way is because we already had infrastructure for relational databases. And we need to be able to get up and running very, very quickly. So this whole system was put together in three months, I think. Um, so we had to get up and running quickly, and we, we know relational databases. But we knew that we had to make change um, uh, a key part of our process going forward. Uh, it's github.com slash mza. Uh, yeah? Um, do you have any assumptions that are involved in the lab part of this? Sure. So uh, there's, a, there's, there's a couple of different lab teams involved. Um, and overall, the whole institute is around 1,000 people. Um, around 125 um, work in informatics. Um, and as I say, around, around 15 or 20 work in sequencing informatics actually doing this stuff. Um, in terms of the actual laboratory parts, um, the rest of it is, is lab people, basically. So there's a large number of people um, in who are involved in pushing these samples actually through the lab, um, getting them done, getting them finished. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of experimental design that goes into making sure that we get high quality sequence and that we're finishing these genomes, particularly the, the species genomes that I've talked about. So there's a large group of people that are just involved in looking at and um, assembling these genomes into a sensible way. Yes, exactly, yes. So any, basically any genomic uh, project that within the Institute uh, we, would, we would provide software for. So that includes uh, the sequencing platform, but there's also other things like genotyping um, and various other bits and pieces that we're involved with as well. Uh, yeah? So I don't know a lot about DNA, but like, how would you know if there was like, a bug in the sequencing? Like, I'd say 2 billion Right, right, right. So the question is, how do we know if there's, if there's a bug? Um, so sequencing isn't perfect. Um, and sequences often make mistakes. And so a lot, of, a lot of what we do and a lot of the time that we spend addressing quality issues like that is in reviewing this metadata from the sequencing run um, because we know at what intensity and at what point a particular base was called. Um, so that's one part of it. Also, we, we sequence the same base many, many millions of times, and that's why it's so expensive. Um, so um, then we just take a consensus at a particular point, and the, the sequences vote, basically. Um, so, um, but they do make mistakes, and we use that information further downstream. And again, that's part of the information that we collect up uh, as we go through. Uh, yeah, on the end. What do you use for intelligence? So we have a lot of custom tools um, that are based around SQL queries, basically. Um, so nothing particularly fancy. We have a lot of denormalized data um, and denormalized databases. So we take it and basically reprocess it and repackage it. Uh, and then we have some queries which will run very, very quickly against the denormalized data. Um, so it's, it's not as bad as you think, actually. It, it, it's manageable. It's manageable compared to the enormous sort of hump of data that you get initially. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah. So given the obvious things I'm testing, like privacy and security and all sorts of stretch things, and so do I have to go down to the vendor and actually educate them that this is a mistake and all of this? Like how large? Sure. 
Uh, so the question is, um, uh, how do we go about testing some of this information? So because the domain moves so quickly, we'll often just take um, a most recent backup copy of the database uh, and then run our, that, that, that's the best we can do. Um, with weekly releases and such a, a, a dynamic area, we can just take what we've seen in the past couple of weeks uh, and then run a full integration test across all the loosely coupled items, basically. Um, so um, there's a couple of million rows in those databases, I think, um, plus the actual production information, which is stored in a slightly different way. Um, but that, that's the best we can do. Uh, yeah, on the end. In terms of a uh, language? No, in terms of, oh, in terms of hardware. In terms of hardware? So we have, um, we have blades, basically. So just IBM blades. Um, we have, I'd say, about 1,000 cores. Um, and then the file system is a Luster, uh, HP Luster file system, um, clustered file system, which seems to work relatively well with these large data sets. But as I say, going forward, that probably won't be good enough because we need to be able to put the data with the analysis. And that's sort of what we're talking about with this sort of virtualized institute. Any more for any more? Yeah? Sure. So um, we're primarily focused on production, uh, so just getting the sequence out there. But uh, a lot of that moves into the analysis steps. So. Um, in terms of the, the numerical analysis and the statistical analysis, and particularly the statistical genomic comparisons, um, these are basically large population studies. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, both sort of input and output from a, a, a wide range of fields. Um, but that's part of what makes it a fun domain to work in, because there's a lot of overlap with, with various different types of medicine. Uh, yeah? Uh, do we have a process of performance testing? Not really, is the answer. Um, we know what's slow, uh, and we know that that's what we have to concentrate on. Um, and we have a bunch of metrics about you know, the average length of time for a job to take, and what should be happening, and, and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, but as I say, with smaller number of resources, we need to focus on the production. So we need to make sure that those, those samples are moving through. And if the analysis at the, at the other end takes you know, an extra day, it doesn't really matter too much. It will matter in time. We've done a lot of good work in parallelizing and distributing our compute across very, very large clusters. Um, but it's a, not a primary focus. We're, we're much more interested in making sure we get the right information at the right point to provide um, value further downstream. So what about this, this you know, data flow uh, garbage that you If it was what, sorry? Oh, if it doubles, um, yeah, we're we're in we're in serious serious trouble. Um, we'll need more storage. We'll need more compute, and we're very lucky that um, the Wellcome Trust um, consider informatics a, a, a primary a primary um, source of investment, basically. So we're often able to get the compute and the the, the funding that we need to to do what we need to do. And as a large scale um, sequencing institute, uh, we're very lucky to that extent. But we are definitely need to get, going to need to get smarter in how we handle our data and our compute um, because it's very easy and we're very used to dealing with a single genome, so it's 15 gigabytes maybe. Uh, and as I say, you can, you can pass that around. It goes on to, a, you know, almost fits on a memory stick these days. Um, but when you've got a couple of petabytes of this stuff, uh, we need to be a lot smarter in how we handle it, particularly as, you know, the, the sort of the workflow in the analysis Excuse me. The workflow in the analysis is, you know, you, you want to you want to get some data, you want to filter it, then you want to do work against it, and work is the interesting bit, and then you're going to generate a subset of that data. You're going to run a normalization on it, some statistical analysis, and you're going to you're going to end up with two copies of the data set basically. So now you've got two petabytes that you need to deal with, um, and as I say, we've got a lot of people that want access to our data, and a lot of people that don't have the large scale resources to deal with these very large data sets, but who are doing very valuable science. So part of our remit is to provide resources um, for people who don't have the resources to do what they need to do. So we are going to need to think more about it. Uh, and virtualization is certainly something that we're, we're looking at very, very seriously in how to put the data together, basically. <coughs> Any more? Yeah, at the back. What should be the model measure like that? Like, if you say sample from the human then what is it? It's the, uh, it, it's the, it, it depends. At, at full capacity, um, it, it runs quite nicely, but the bottleneck is always the number of sequences that we have. So we have, I think, 28 sequences at the moment. 
Um, and if we had twice as many, we could probably put twice as many through. But we'd need then twice as much compute and twice as much um, storage, and that then starts to become the bottleneck. As it is, we can only keep our raw data for around three to four weeks. We only have enough storage for that amount. And after that, we have to have analyzed it, and then we have to delete it. Otherwise, then we get a bottleneck further upstream. So um, that's a big challenge as well. Yeah? I, I think I may have misheard the number, but it sounded like you said there were 3,000 base pairs in the human genome. Uh, sorry, uh, 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. That's right. But you said 15 terabytes of data. If each pair is, is 15 gigabytes. 15 gigabytes. If each base pair is B, T, A, or C, that's only two bits to store. So there's additional quality and other information that's associated with it. Um, and sample information and things like that. So it works out at about, yeah, 10, 15 gigabytes um, for, for a human genome. And that's what you can download from our FTP site. So that's just metadata about the base pairs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Um, they, so malaria is, is, a, is a very, obviously a very important area. Um, so pathogens are notoriously difficult to sequence. And malaria is one of the most important pathogens. And so again, with our, we have a very broad remit to handle these sort of things. And so we go after the, we tend to go after the, the big problems first of all. Um, so malaria is obviously a big problem um, because you get different strains and they have different virulence and they have different um, uh, susceptibilities to different types of drugs. And in the third world, where drugs are very expensive, you want to make sure that you're getting the right drug which will treat the right strain. And so what we're trying to do, and what we're ramping up and scaling up to do, is to identify these different strains so that we can deliver the right medicine at the right point uh, in the third world and, and make that more, more cost effective. In terms of hypertension, um, we know that there's a genetic link, and we know a lot of people suffer from it. So uh, that was a natural thing. Same with diabetes. Uh, yeah? Roughly 1% of the population is naturally immune to HIV. Right. Have you done any genetic mapping to try to find what the genes are that make them immune? Uh, we haven't, no. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's more than likely we'll look at it. We're, we're doing more and more virology. But as I say, viruses are very, very, different to se very, very difficult to sequence. Same with other pathogens. Well, I, I meant sequencing the human genome of the people who are immune looking for a correlation pathogen. Yeah, again, um, I think um, it's something we'll get to. <laughs> <laughs> Not this week. Yeah. So with this amount of data flow and this amount of data, mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so in a miraculous feat of English planning, our data center, our data center is at the end of a World War II runway. Um, so there's a RAF Duxford, if any of you have been there, just outside Cambridge. Uh, they fly World War II Spitfires and Tiger Moths and all the other things. At the end of the runway, our data center. Um, <laughs> Tell me if you think that, if that's odd, right? Um, so what we're most concerned is, yeah, that the thing will burn down or that a tiger moth will crash into the side of it. Um, but seriously, backup is a really big problem for us. We have so much data online all the time, um, and we don't archive anything off. It's always spinning, and it's always available to whoever and anybody wants it. Um, so backing it up is a big, big problem. And we have these big tape robots. I don't know if you guys have seen these, these big cylindrical things with little hands that go in. It's awesome to watch. Um, and we store those tapes off-site. But if disaster did happen, say we had a fire, our data center burnt down, it would take a year just to recover the data from the tapes. Uh, so we'd be out of action for a year. So it's a really big problem, and again, why we need to look at more distributed approaches. Uh, yeah? Is that just like pearlized concrete from the, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got a beautiful like, stainless steel and glass building. It looks awesome, but I'm not sure it's going to withstand a spitfire to the face. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so we have, um, we have a lot of key collaborators around the world, either with, we have good partnerships with vendors and good partnerships with other universities, particularly those working with cutting edge large data sets. Uh, and primarily, um, there aren't that many fields in science that have traditionally had to deal with these very, very large data sets. Um, so uh, it's traditionally the high energy physics, uh, so the large hadron colliders, and the astronomers uh, who do these sky surveys. So they, they're basically looking for moving for moving um, items in the sky every night, particularly things that are getting bigger. Um, <laughs> and, 
And they have similar data requirements, and so we work very closely with them to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I, what I would say is we're not sure we're doing this right, um, but it's just what we found has worked uh, in a relatively short space of time. Any more questions? Oh, there's a couple more. Yeah? Uh, our algorithms, I don't think, are. Um, but there is this, um, I think it was the Shaman or something. They used something, something of ours to generate a whole tune. So it's on one of their, uh, one of their I think it's on one of their organic albums. But that was generated using, using some piece of DNA or DNA algorithm. But um, I don't think, in, in terms of, you're thinking like in terms of Pandora and uh, classification. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I don't think any of our algorithms are used for that, no. Which is a pity. Yeah. Sure. So, um, so the question is, um, is it all software, or are there physical interfaces that we have to implement with robotics? And the answer is, that, yeah, we we use a lot of robots um, because we're such high throughput. We're such high throughput system. Um, a human basically couldn't handle it all, um, and it's much more efficient for a robotic for a robot to do it. Um, so yeah, so we work a lot um, in automation. Uh, physical automation, um, and um, it can all get a bit Heath Robinson, but it kind of works. You know, there's um, we do a lot of barcoding, um, and so as uh, these plates with samples, they have 96 samples loaded. As they whiz around the lab, barcode readers read them at various places, so we know where they are. They get loaded into the right place on these large flatbed robots, and then picking handles will come up and, and select um, bacterial pickers when we were doing the original human genome. So we'd grow up recombinant um, DNA and bacteria, and then pick the best colonies automatically, all that sort of thing. And if you go to, um, if you go to the Wellcome Trust Museum, at, uh, at near, just outside Euston in London, um, there's one of our robots working in there, so you can take a look at that. Um, also, Henry Wellcome, who started the Wellcome Trust, um, had a slightly unusual English trait in that he used to collect many, many thousands of identical things. And so if you go to his museum, he, there's like a thousand glass jars, all exactly the same, or a thousand fake limbs, all identical. It's bizarre, anyway. Uh, yeah, we've got time for one more. Uh, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, folks. <laughs>